Be'ezus Hashem, today's daf is daf nun gimel, and we're going to begin on daf nun beis and beis. I just wanted to discuss um, um, the, just the Mishnah. Uh, the Mishnah discussed over here that in addition to the Tanai Ksuba, in addition to the conditions of the Ksuba, uh, there are other conditions that a husband has to require for his wife. And, and this is very important. Um, what happens is like this. Suppose a woman has, uh, her father gives her, the, you know, the cabin that he has upstate as her dowry, you know. And what could potentially happen is that if the husband marries two wives and then that one, uh, both wives die, women died earlier than the men back then, and the husband inherited. So he inherited the cabin that her, her, his wife brought in to the marriage. And what's going to happen is when he dies, it's going to be split. The cabin may end up in the hands of not their mother's children, but the other wife's children. You understand? So if he had two wives and each one had res respective children and one wife brought in uh, the, the, the cabin or a family heirloom, it, if potentially what could have happened is when the both wives died, then the husband inherited his wife. And then when he died, the assets are split amongst the two the children from the two different wives, and what can happen is a family heirloom can end up into into strange children, other children that were not the the grandfathers, the mothers, the fathers, the father of the mother. So therefore, in order to prevent that, and people were not giving dowries, and to give a dowry, you uh, the Gemara described before that the Gemara described yesterday that you're supposed to give up to ten percent of your assets for a dowry for your girl to get her married. And people were hesitant to do that because they were finding that their assets are ending up into strange into families not belonging to their daughter. So therefore, they made a new rule that you write in the ksuba when you get married, and that's called benin dichrin. Her children are going to inherit the the dowry. That means her children are going to inherit everything that she brought into the marriage. So the cabin, uh, even though she the the, the lady died first. And then, so technically, the husband inherited that cabin. When he dies, the cabin reverts back to her children, not the husband's second wife's children. So that's that's plus 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 the inheritance of her ksuba, which technically would have been two hundred had she been alive, but she died. Also ends up into into her children. That's called benindrichnam. So the Mishnah said, Loikosav, if you didn't write this condition that she inherits, her, her boys will inherit the assets belonging to their family heirloom. Loikosav, la, benin dirchen the yavad lechemina in a yartin kasef. You didn't write it into the ksuba. Yes, al chuken de mechain, chayev. It's obligated. It means you can't get around that. You can't get around. Even if you didn't write this condition that the dowry that she brought in, and her kasuba will end up with her kids. It still, it, it still automatically ends up in, with her kids because it's a tanai bezdin. I don't think today we write that that if she brings in the dowry because usually we don't marry two people anyway. We, you know, but this is what they used to write. Then there's another condition in the kasuba, and the kasuba is that says benon nukfin the avilchaminai. In other words, when a guy writes a ksuba for his wife, he says that if we end up having daughters, right, your daughters have a right to my assets to, to get food, clothing, and shelter until they go get married. That, that is the condition. And if he didn't write that, it's automatic. It's automatic that uh, they collect, they collect uh, their food from his assets. Now it's interesting. A father is not required to to give food for his daughters while they're al while he's alive. But after he dies, if they're ten year old, if they're a ten year old or eleven year old, they have a right to go to his assets, and that's one of the ksuba that he had to write for their mother that they have a right to collect from his assets food for food, clothing, and shelter. Okay. Now we're going to get start from the bottom of the page, Rapapa. The Gemara says like this: Rapapa i asik le lebrei be abosuria. The Gemara says like this: Hi, Alan. We're just starting over here. Uh, Rapapa i asik le lebrei be abosura. Rapapa was busy marrying off his 
his uh, his son to the daughter of Abba Surah. The, the, the daughter of Abba Surah actually was Rapapa. Rapapa had a second wife, okay? And he had a son from another wife. Another So, so this second wife had a sister. So Rapapa's son, Rapapa got his son to, to try to marry his second wife's sister, okay? So basically his current father-in-law has another daughter and Rapapa is busy getting his son married, engaged. Now we're talking about, again, the mitzvah is that a father has to provide a dowry for his for his daughter, up to 10%. So also, a papa went to the place where his father-in-law was living, to work out the negotiations of the ksuba, how much dowry this Abba Surah is going to give. Shama Yehuda Bamareba, Yehuda Bamareba, her papa is coming to the town, Dafet Asar Ischazaleh. He went out to greet Rapapa. Rapapa was a great person. So it's, 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 you go out and greet Rapapa. He's coming to negotiate with his father-in-law the, the dowry. But when he got to the door, Rapapa got to the door of Abba Surah, and they were going in to discuss the negotiation, Yehuda Bar Merema backed away. He didn't want to go in to, to see how the negotiations are being conducted. Amalei, so Rapapa and said, Neil Mar Bahadai, come in and... Uh, Come in and 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 see uh, and 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 witness what's going on over here. You go to Mem Gimel Amid uh, Nun Gimel Amid Aleph. So the Gemara says, "Kazia that I have a but the Rab Rab Papa saw that Rab Yehuda Bar did not want to go in. Amalei, so Rab Papa said, "My daita, what's what's your problem? You have a problem with with uh, dowries." Mishum the Amalei Shmuel Rab Yehuda. Rab Shmuel said to Rab Yehuda, "Shinena." Shmuel said to Rabbi Yehuda, sharp one, never be, uh, never be a witness to somebody that wants to transfer his assets from his bad son to his good son. So he makes up a will that really basically gives most of his assets to his good son and not to his bad son. Because a father, just because he thinks he has a bad son, it could be wrong. You never know, maybe the bad son will have a good son. The coach came with and therefore, because when you see people taking assets that belonging to the to to one child and giving it to another child, Shmuel told Yehuda, "Don't be an, don't be a witness to that." And over here, so maybe Yehuda Rapapa is thinking that Yehuda Mamarema doesn't want to come witness as this this uh, father-in-law Abbasiroi is going to transfer some assets that he really would have been earmarked for his sons and is giving it to his daughter as a dowry. So therefore, that's why Rehuda Bamarema did not want to come into Ab, to witness the negotiations of Abu Surai giving a, a dowry for his daughter. So the Gemara says, so Rabbi Papa explained to him, giving a dowry to your daughter is the right thing to do. Hainami to count the Rabbanu. It's a tekan of the Rabbanu, the Amar Rabbi Yechem Shem Rabbi Shem Yechai, that a person should give a, uh, make his daughter, you know, uh, have a dowry so people would want to go out and, and marry them. So, so the Gemara, so that's why maybe you didn't want to come because you think he's doing something illegal. So Amalei, so Yehuda Bar said, "Hani mili midate la shui nami." That's only if the guy gives a dowry because he wants to give a dowry. Can you force the guy to give a dowry? So, so if I come in, I'm going to force the guy to give a dowry. So a papa said to him, "Amalei atami kamini lady ulvashye." Did I tell you to go in and force the guy to give a dowry? I didn't tell you to force him to give a dowry. Come in and observe the negotiation. Ulvaloi to ashye kamina. Go in and don't force anything. You know, just observe that how much he's giving for a dowry for his daughter. Amalei. So he said, "Ma'ili didi haini ashye." Yehuda Bar said that if I show up to this negotiations, this guy Beisura is going to be so you know, uh, uh, embarrassed seeing me there that he's going to give more than he really wants to give for a dowry for his daughter. And therefore, that's like forcing him to give what he didn't intend to give. Ach, baby, oh, Rapapa forced Yehuda Bar to come into this negotiation, and he went in. And Ishtik, the said, he sat there quietly and didn't say one word. So as the negotiation continues on, Savahu Mirtach Rasach, the Beisura thought Yehuda Bar is very angry that thinking that Yehuda Bar is not happy how much he's giving. So Kosvei Lechol Madahavale he wrote his entire wealth over to this girl as a dowry. The Saif Amalei in the end Beisura said Hashdenami Lemishtei Mar I see you're not saying anything 
don't you see? I just wrote all my assets to this girl for her dowry. So, the, so Yehuda Ben Meremi said, "Chay the Mar, I swear to you, like Shaviki me the." He said also, "Chay Smag, like Shaviki me the Nafshe." I don't have anything left to give her. I'm giving all my assets to my daughter. Amalei. So Yehuda Ben Meremi said, "Oh, you did it wrong." Imenai Didi, if you would have asked me first, Afri lahay nami deksafte leinichli. Whatever you wrote down in the beginning, I wouldn't have been happy. You don't have to give so much dowry for your daughter. Oh, so he realized that he gave too much for his daughter. Amalei hashaname ahadabi. So I take it all back. Amalei. So Yudah Marema said, "Shavi enafshah, shavi enafshah." I, I, I would have told you to keep it. Hadarna, hadrana, to take it back. Once you committed to it, like I mean, I'm not going to tell you to take it back. Once you committed to this, that's the dowry for your daughter. So what happened over here was that Rapapa came to the the mechutin, which actually turned out to be his father-in-law anyway but from a different marriage. But he came to the Mechotin to negotiate a dowry for a daughter. And it turned out, because he had somebody extra in the room, the father, the Mechotin, actually wrote more. He actually gave all his assets to this daughter as, as a dowry. And uh, and uh, that's the, that really shouldn't have happened. The person should not give more than 10%. But he was so uh, um, you know shy or embarrassed because Yehuda Marei was there. This is what happened. And uh, that's the story of the Gemara. The Gemara says like this, Rabbi Yehim Saba asked a question from Rabbi Nachman. Again, part of the K'nai Suba is, part of the K'nai Suba is that a person has a right to anything dowry that was brought into the marriage, right? Let's say a man has two wives. So the dowry that's brought into the marriage from one wife is only inherited by her boys, not by the other children. Technically, if she died, uh, she died first, then... Her assets, her dowry belongs to her husband. And when when he dies, and or his, his second wife dies, and then he dies, so then that all that dowry ends up being split for boys that he had that was not from it, that wife that brought in the dowry. And therefore, that's called ksuba's been indifferent, where the ksuba requires that the dowry that's brought in and the ksuba itself uh, go directly to the children of that woman. And then the rest of the assets you split like a regular Yerusha, whatever he had. But the the, the, the dowry specifically belongs to her boys. So the Gemara requested a question like this. Rabbi Yehim Saba asked the question of Rabbi Nachman. A person sold a ksuba to her husband. The question is, a guy sold a ksuba to her husband. Now, how do you sell a ksuba to your husband? You say it like this. It's actually a derivative, an option. Because he, he, uh, although the ksuba is, let's say, 200 zuz, but there's always a chance that she dies first, he didn't have to pay the ksuba. It's only if he died or gave her a divorce, he, he would have to pay the ksuba. So a ksuba is like an option, like on a stock. You don't know. It's uh, It has a certain value, but it's not the full value. So a, guy, a woman said that if her husband would die uh, or he divorces her, he she he would not have to pay the ksuba, except... Uh, but she, she, he, she would, you know, get money from him now, in exchange for that, she basically sold him the rights to collect the ksuba. So did she, did she also sell the rights of benindichron that the dowry he doesn't have to di directly give it to her boys, but he can give it to the other children as well when he dies, or or there is no ksubas benindichron. So the Gemara asks the question, I'm a lay rubber. So Rabbi says, Viti Why don't you have this question if a lady forgave her husband on the ksuba? Now forget the logistics about this, because if a woman forgave, forgave her husband that he doesn't have to pay ksuba, that means he can't stay with her, he can't live with her. But he could still be married, but you can't have relations with that husband. The Gemara, the Gemara wants that there's always a financial loss if a husband divorces his wife. But Forget that for a moment. She forgave her husband. She loves her husband so much. She said, you know what? If you divorce me or you die, I will not collect suba. She forgave her husband suba. What would that be? And that's very common that could happen. Selling uh, the suba to your husband back to your husband is uncommon. So why don't you ask that question? Amale, so the Gemara says, so that's what Rabbi Yehima, the Amale, so he said like this. Rabbi, uh, the, the Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yemis Saba said, I'm not asking Rabbi Nachman that question because hashta mecheres come by lead. I'm only questioning about mecheres. And, and certainly, once I know mecheres, I'll know mecheres. The afagav, the equal name is Uza Anasek. I could say that when she only sold the ksuba, she only sold the right 
of the, the, the ksuba of 200, the Taisvis ksuba, but not the dowry. The dowry should revert to her boys. The Amina, what forces a woman to sell her ksuba? Because she wants to have a little extra cash for herself. The Amina, she's like being whipped by a whip a hundred times. And therefore, she's like forced into it. A woman selling her ksuba is like, you know, at the, you know, scraping the bottom of the barrel, but she wants a little cash for herself. So therefore, she sold her ksuba. And the question is, because she sold her ksuba, so maybe she only sold her ksuba and, and not the rights for benindichrim, not the rights for the dowry. Or maybe she sold everything. And therefore, the, the dowry also, you know, uh, get, reverts back to the husband. And therefore, when, when he dies, it's split amongst the other children. So if we decide that, that when she sold, she sold everything, certainly that if she forgave her husband, the ksuba, certainly she would not have ksubas bin indichrim. Amar Rabbah. So Rabbah explained, Rabbah took a stab at this question. Pshitili, it's very simple to me. Mecheres ksuba salachem. If a woman sold her ksuba to other people, a stranger. Again, it's this is like a, a, a derivative, a, a, a core option. That means that if somebody says to a, a woman sold her, her the rights to her ksuba to somebody else. And the guy who bought it is taking a bet. What's the bet? That if she, if the husband dies first, he will collect the ksuba. And if she dies first, he loses the investment. So she sold the ksuba. Rava said, Yesh la ksubas bin indichrim. She for certainly gets ksubas bin indichrim. That still always remains. The dowry will always remain with her boys. Why? My time. What's the reason why she sold the ksuba? Zuzayana side. It's not because she, she thinks ksubas bin indichrim is nothing. It's because uh, the, she needed the money. And she didn't mean to sell the ksubas bin indichrim. But if she totally forgave a ksuba to her, uh, her husband, she received no remuneration for it. She just said, husband, you can keep the ksuba. That means she doesn't even care about the dowry. She doesn't care about the cabin that's in, you know, upstate that was part of her dowry. She doesn't mind that it, it ends up with his other children from the other wife. So any luck ksuba's been in there. Then certainly she doesn't have ksuba's been in there. My timer, Achuli Achelsi, she forgave him. But this is the question. The in between, between Michael and Meicher regarding the husband is Meicheres Ksubas Labalo. If you sold the Ksubas to the husband, Kimacheres Lachem Dami, is it like you sold it to somebody else? And therefore, there is Ksubas Ben Indechren. Or is it like she forgave the husband and she will not have Ksubas Ben Indechren because she, she, she said, it's almost like she said, I don't care about the dowry because she's selling it to her husband. Then Rabbi asked the question and he gave his own answer. A person, a woman who sells a ksuba back to her husband, so she got a little cash for her ksuba. It's, it's like she sold it to somebody else, and therefore she only gets she 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 gets ksubas It's not that she's getting it. Ksubas bin was not sold. The ksuba was sold, but the condition, the extra condition that was added into the ksuba remains intact. So should she die, right? Should she die, the, the, and then, you know, he dies, his, his other wife dies, and then he dies, all the dowry that was in that ksuba still will revert to her children. Masiv Rav Idi Barav, and Rav Idi Barav asked the question. We learned in a brisa, we learned in a mission, we learned in Yavamis, a woman who, who, who had, whose husband went to a, on another part of the world. No one heard from him. One aide comes, says, oh, I, I saw your husband died. And then, so she got married to somebody else. Right. So then her former husband shows up. So now she married to somebody else and she illegally was an Aishish Ish. So the, the Mishnah says she gets divorced from both her second husband, obviously, and, and from the first husband, she can't go back. And the Brisa says, the Mishnah says, Mesa, if she dies, ain't Yershin Sazev, ain't Yershin Sazev, Yershin Ksubas. Nobody, she, nobody of her children can get her Ksuba. There is no Ksuba over here. So the Gemara says, what does that mean? What does the Mishnah mean that she died? Nobody gets ksuba. What ksuba does she have? She illegally got married to somebody else. She was an Aishish Ish. And, and, and she never has ksuba. She lost her ksuba from her original husband. She's certainly not going to get a ksuba from the hus second husband who wasn't supposed to take her in the first place. Vamar a papa, a papa says, and it means like this, ksuba has been indichrem. She lost even the t'nai ksuba of her original husband, where the dowry was supposed to go to her children. It doesn't go to her children. It goes to, it could be split with the other children the, the first husband had from another wife. 
And so the Gemara says like this, but am I, why does the Ksum has been indifferent get, get canceled? She was forced into this. She made a big mistake. It wasn't her fault. And eight, one eight kid said, your husband died. So why should she lose that, that Tanai Ksuba of, of that her family gets to keep her original dowry? And says the Gemara, Hossam, the reason is she loses it. Rabban. Rabban gave her a knas because at the end of the day, who, why did she get married to somebody else? She only had one A that said her original husband died. The reason why is because she wanted to get married to somebody else. She didn't research the matter. And because she didn't research the matter and we trusted her, so if something goes wrong, she loses every possible right that she had. She lost her ksuba. She lost the marriage. She lost even ksuba spin in dechrim. But just Tom, if a woman sells her ksuba to somebody else because she's financially strapped, no, she doesn't lose her ksuba spin in dechrim. She just she just selling the right of the two hundred uh, of the two hundred zuz in the ksuba. Dukamal Yosef Rava Bachnina Kamei Rav Chida. Rav was sitting in front of Rav Chizda. The Yosef Kachama Mishmei Rabbi Laza. He said in the name of Elaza. Laza. Mechelas ksuba salabala. A woman said, "Honey, I don't want to take your ksuba. If you die, I'm not collecting ksuba." Ain la mazoyne. She gave up the right that if he dies, she can't collect any food. That means that normally when a when a husband dies, as long as she didn't collect her ksuba, she could she could um, she could collect mezainus. She could collect food and shelter. But but here she forgave the whole ksuba, so she she lost the tnai ksuba, which that means she she will not get mezainus either. Amale, so Rav Chizda uh, did not like that. He loved the comment made to Rabbi. Because you said this in the name of a great person, you said in the name of Rab Loza. I would tell you that we shouldn't do that. If you if you give if you return bad for somebody that did you good, then uh, all all bad, bad will continue to go to your house. In other words, th this woman did a big favor to her husband that uh, you know she forgave the tsuba. So therefore, now when her husband dies, you're going to tell her, oh, because you forgave the ksuba, you can't get food anymore. You can't take from the assets to have little food. So therefore, that's called returning somebody who did good to you. You're returning something bad. And when you do something and you do, if you return bad for good, then bad things happen to you, you, you know, basically bringing a bad mazel to yourself. Another Gemara. Yosef Ramnach Mabula Babi Mabraya Papi. Yosef Rechiv Bar Amegabe. And Asa Hugaver, there was a person that came, the Shiva Arusa said, that his Arusa died. In other words, we know that if a person does uh, uh, Arusin uh, engagement, the Arus is not obligated, is, is obligated to give a Ksuba. In other words, if he decides to, if he died or divorced her, he would have to give a Ksuba. So the guy, what happened was the Arus died, oh, the, the, the girl died. All she was was engaged to this guy, but she died. Now, who pays for the funeral cost? So Amr, Amr Le, so they, Rav Nachman and Ula and Aviva said, Zilkvar, I have la ksuba. You have a responsibility as Oris to bury her, or you have to give her a ksuba. In other words, since you're not paying her ksuba because she died, she's not collecting anything from you, you therefore you have the obligation to bury her, to pay for the funeral cost. Amr Le, Rav Chia, Tenina, Rav Chia said, we'd learned, Ishtar Rusa, Loi Oinim, Loi Metamala, the Chain He, Loi Oinanis, Loi Metamaloi, Mesa, Eni Yosha, Mesu, Goivik Subasa. We learned that an Ishtar Rusa, just because you're engaged, you're not considered to be his real wife. And therefore, the one, the point that we were saying over here, Mesu, who, if he would die, Goivik Subasa, that, that means she collects a ksuba. If he dies, she collects a ksuba. So we we would say from this brisa, taima the mesu only because he died, ha mesa he. But if she died, and therefore ain la ksuba means there's no there's another uh, no obligations of ksuba regarding the husband. If she died, he doesn't have to bury her. That's what we're trying to learn from this brisa. So therefore, Rav Chia disagreed with Rav Nachman Ulan Abimin. Rav Nachman Ulan Abimi required the Oris to pay for the funeral costs. Rav Chia said the Oris does not have to pay for the funeral costs. My time, because they're not really married. Um, Rav Shaya, she ain't on the kari ball. It's not the akad titli mashe kost lechi, because I can't, I uh, can't uh, uh, keep the rest of the ksuba, which says that when you get married to somebody else, you can take what belongs to you, what's written here. Because she's not going to get married to somebody else. She died. But the bottom line is, they're not really married because they're not really married. 
He's not obligated to pay the funeral costs. So was the opinion of Rabchia, and that seems to be the halacha. Ravan came from Eretz Yisrael and said in the name of Rosh Lakish, a Rusa that dies, there's no din ksuba. A Aris does not have to pay for the funeral cost. Uh, but they knew that already. Go tell him, this Ravan, we go to Amabay, go take your halacha and put it to the thorns. We already know our Rav Shaya, we have a, a brisa from Rav Shaya that was brought, that was learned in Bavel that already indicated that an Arus, just because you're engaged to a girl, you don't have to pay for the funeral costs. Nugamar, benam nikvin l'chavi l'chuminai. One of the tonight Suba is that what? That that the girls, the girls have to get supported after the, uh, they can eat food, clothing, and shelter after the man dies. Till when do they eat Till when do they eat? So Rav Omar Rav says they can take food, clothing, and shelter ad the tlak and the until they get married, like it says in the Ksuba. The lady says tani at the bagrim until they turn to over like twelve and a half, until they become adults. So the Gemara says the Rav afadav the bagar. Would Rav say that a fifteen-year-old girl will still stay take take food from her father's assets? It doesn't make sense. Once she turns into adult, she can she can go get a job and, and supply herself. Nobody holds that Bigeris will take uh, if she's an adult. She takes she takes the food from her, her father's assets. She actually left the jurisdiction of her father. The lady, even lady, says uh, uh, they take up until she becomes an adult. What happened? She got married at ten. Let's say she gets married at ten. Uh, her husband's supplying food. So why should she take food from the from the from this person's assets? From her father's assets, if her husband is supplying food, Afadav the Insip, even if she gets married, Ella Bog the what so what is the machlekis between Rav and Lady? Ella Boga Vilay Insip, Insibile Boga the Kuliyama Lay Pligi. If she's an adult and did not get married, or she got married and is not an adult, she's let's say 10 years old, not married and not an adult, no Kuliyami Lay Pligi, everybody nobody argues she does not get Mazinus. She cannot take food. Keep pleading. When, when are they arguing? Barusa, Veloy Bagar. She's an Arusa, but, but she did not. She's not an adult. So let's say she got engaged and she's a ten-year-old girl, but she's only an Arusa. Now, really, her new husband, her Arus, does not require her to is not required to pay for food because they didn't get married yet. But he's not going to allow her to be without food. So automatically, he's going to start supplying her with food. So because he's he he might supply her with food, therefore. Technically, she shouldn't be taking any more from her father's assets. The chain tani levi masnisa. So that's what Rav holds. Rav holds since she was already engaged, she doesn't take. She does not take any. Um, she does not take any food. But lady holds no. She has to be fully married. Just like uh, you know, she's in, when she becomes an adult, she's really an adult. She has to be fully married. But up until she's fully married, she could always take. She could always take food. Ella, lady has a brisa. Rabbi taught, brought a brisa that said there are two, there are two ways a, a girl will stop taking food, food expenses from her father's assets. Or she became an adult. Or either it reached her time to get married. Either she actually was married. She got, you know, went to the chuppah, or she was engaged for 12 months. Once a girl is engaged to 12 months, then the artist is obligated. It's not because he's a nice guy, he has to do it. He's obligated to give her mezoinus. Okay? Kitanoi. Uh, we're going to do, do a little bit, one more line. Kitanoi. Uh, Kitanoi, like we learned in the Machleik is Tanoi. Admosai habas nizoinus. How long will, will a bas get food from their father's assets? One man, the Amma says, Achiti Aris, until she's engaged. Mishim Rablaza Ame Achiti Bogar, until she became an adult. So you see, this, this it seems that Samachlek is Rav went with this first ta Tana that says that uh, once the, she becomes engaged, she automatically she automatically stops taking Mizoinus. And the Rablaza said, like, lady, no, she has to turn into an adult. Tana Rab Yosef Ati Hevian. Rab Yosef had a price that says, till she, you know, hooks up with somebody. What does Rabbi Yosef mean? That means hooking up with just Erison or hooking up with just Nisun. 
Teku. The Gemara remains by a question. So we don't know what Rav Yosef's opinion is, but again, we know what Rav's opinion, Lady's opinion, what the two Tanaim is, and they're, they're basically two opinions. Either they, she, once she comes engaged, she stops taking uh, food. On the other opinion is, no, she has to be actually be married or turn into an adult. She had to go to chuppah with somebody. One more line of Gemara. Amalei Rav Chizel Rav Yosef. Rav Chizel said to Rav Yosef, Misha Mi Aloch Minei Rav Yehuda, Arusi Yesh Lam Mazonis, Ha'ein Lam Mazonis. Rav Chizel asked Rav Yosef, did you hear from Rav Yehuda, that was your Rebbe, that Arusa Yesh Lam Mazonis, Ha'ein Lam Mazonis, a girl who became engaged, will she be able to take Mazonis from her father's assets or not? Amalei, so Rav Yosef answered, Mishma Lashmile. I did not hear anything from Rav Yehuda, what his opinion is, but I'll tell you what I, what I think. Elamisvara less long. That I think that she should not get any food. Why? It came in the Ersa because she got engaged. So then automatically the Oris, the, the, the fiance, is gonna make sure she has food. The Lainika like the sizzle. She doesn't he doesn't want her to be embarrassed and shamed. So he's automatically gonna start supplying food, even though he's not required to. And therefore, once she's gonna get something from the Oris, she should not be taking from her brother's assets food. She should take it from her new fiance. Amalei, um, so Rav Chizda said the opposite. I would say, no, just the opposite. She should continue to take food from the brother's assets. And here, why not? She's engaged, and the, the artist is going to look after her. Their fiancé is going to look after her. And the answer is no. Maybe the break, engagement is going to break off. Because King Vindale, King Lebegava, he's, he's not by her. Maybe maybe he, he thinks to himself, I might find something wrong with the girl. And therefore, I'm going to break off the engagement. So therefore, he's not going to throw out his money for nothing. He's not going to supply food because he always has in the back of his mind, perhaps I'm going to find something wrong. And therefore, this whole engagement will be broken off. The the other say the, 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 the opinions were reversed. So Rav Yosef said, I hold that she should get. Why she should continue to take from the from the from the brother's assets? Since the husband doesn't know for sure, he, this fiance doesn't know for sure he's going to you know consummate the marriage. Maybe he may break it off because he'll find something wrong with her. He's not going to throw out his money for nothing. Maybe he's gonna he's not going to take her. He's not going to take her, and therefore he's she's not going to supply her with food. Therefore, she should continue to take food from her father's assets. Amalei, so Rav Chizda was the one that answered, if you didn't hear about it, I would say she doesn't. Because as soon as she's engaged to this guy, no matter what, the fiancé is going to supply food. Even if he's not 100% sure this marriage is going to go through, he's still going to buy food. He doesn't want her to be shamed by you know not having food. So he's going to apply, supply food and therefore, because she's 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 gonna get food from him, she should not be taken from the husband from the, her father's assets, which really now belong to the brothers. Okay, we will stop here.